talk today talk or give you a brief introduction to some methods of intelligent systems. It can only be a brief introduction because normally um, my students can enjoy three whole semesters of this stuff and I try to compact all this in one hour. So I'll probably also leave most of the mathematics out of it and just give you a hint what could be useful to some of your project groups. I also um, changed a bit of the original topic. First I wanted to talk about only computational intelligence, but after I've seen all the presentations of the 17 and now 12 groups, I come to the conclusion that maybe I just um, yeah, talk about some topics that actually have nothing to do with computation intelligence, like the terms defined, but may be useful to some of you in terms of signal pre-processing, in terms of um, creating rules for your software development projects, and do only some things about the computation intelligence themselves. First, I'd just like to introduce myself. Some already know me, some don't, so my name is Hal Burgsteiner. Um, you also have my contact email address up from here. I'm from the Institute for eHealth from the Graz University of Applied Sciences. Normally, I did lectures in the past about the typical computer science stuff like software engineering, databases, networking. But recently, I've switched my focus to the area where I've been PhD on back to computation intelligence, knowledge based systems, decision support, and data security. Because I think, especially in the healthcare segment, it's very important to have. Um, some ideas how these typical IT systems might be enhanced a little bit and all these areas will play a crucial role in the future. Like it's common, as I was told, I'd like, also like to introduce my university and what we do. The Graz University of Applied Sciences has about four to five thousand students all together and we offer 40 bachelor, master and degree programs in six departments. One I will focus on is the department where my institute is located in, the Department for Applied Computer Sciences, which consists of three institutes with only about 400, uh, sorry, 500 students altogether and about 50 employees. We offer bachelor and master's degrees in especially e-health, but also in, in more common computer science, <coughs> information management, internet technology, software design, and things like that. So this should also be an invitation to all of you who are um, still doing your bachelor's or probably have towards your master's degrees. So you're all invited to come to Ugrat University to spend a semester here, do your do some lectures, do your diploma thesis. We have contracts with more than part, 200 partner universities all over the world. I don't know if all of your universities are already partnered with us, but we will be found a way anyway. So, if you consider it, I'd also like to tell you Graz is a wonderful town located in the south of Austria. So when I came here, we already had about 20-25 degrees Celsius and no wind. So it was quite a temperature shock to come here. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, this is a really good city for students. When you look at the numbers, about a fifth of the whole population of Graz consists of students. Distributed over eight universities altogether, and it's really worthwhile living a semester in Graz and doing some study. So, back to the topic of my lecture itself. We already heard a lot about possible applications of intelligence in, in software systems. So in many of the presentations on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, we heard statements like decision supports should be added somewhere in the future. Or we have somehow to detect serious conditions of a patient. Caregivers should be supported when they're looking for elderly people in their decisions or what to do. And we also had one first example of a simple rule-based system on Monday. I don't know which group it was, but they had um, a statement, if heart rate equals zero, then we have a problem. This is a typical example of a rule-based system, uh, rule system, but it's a very simple rule. So, and this is only easily achievable if you have a single parameter, you have certain thresholds, you can detect and you can say, okay, if it a certain value is above the threshold, then we do something. But in reality, this is a bit more complicated. Imagine you not only having one attribute that you should monitor, but you have several, several hundred attributes that you have to, or you should monitor in parallel. And then you have to create rules based on hundreds of these attributes. You try to find out, find out is something serious going on? Is the patient still healthy? Is he still alive? 
or should someone react? Also, from the um, side of the system developer or software engineer, you sometimes don't want to have your code being cluttered with all these if statements, switch statements, and things like that. So sometimes it's necessary or good if you create a subsystem that you hand over some parameters and you get an answer telling you um, yes or no or a certain prediction for the, the remaining lifetime or whatever. And there are um, really many approaches and technologies available. And this is where I have to um, filter some of the methods out that are currently being developed and doing research. Um, so I try to focus this talk on things that can be useful to some of you. So maybe I'd like to ask you a question first. Please show of hands. How many of you have um, done mathematics in their curriculum and know how to deal with vectors and matrices? Oh. <laughs> how many of you know how to deal with eigenvalues and eigenvectors? Okay. Good. Okay. That was good. I try to leave out most of the mathematical stuff or highly theoretical mathematical stuff. I try to introduce some methods, how they work and what you can do with them, but not go into too much detail about that. And also, the methods you could choose depends on what data you have. There is no overall best solution for every problem, as you might imagine, but it depends what data have you got. Basically, we can differentiate between data that comes from a single moment in time, like, for example, laboratory results, or you take a picture of something, like, for example, a picture of the, the, the little pill box that one group had displayed or presented. Um, you have a genome that is rather static and doesn't change all the day. You have physicians' amnesis data, for example, and this is what I refer to data from a single moment in time. So you have a fixed length or a fixed number of attributes that you have to deal with. There's a bunch of methods that, that can uh, be used for these type of data. A completely different story is it if you have time varying data, uh, for which you do, know, do not know in advance how long it will be. For example, if you use things like speech recognition, each word has a different length. So a short word has just a few samples, a long word, like many of those I have come to know in Finnish, have rather a long time to speak it out. So you don't have uh, the same amount of data you have to deal with every time. And also, as a tribute to our host here, I've uh, remembered myself that I came across a whole of a whole lot of people that actually are from Finland and Helsinki that contributed um, very interesting stuff to the area of computational intelligence. Most of them coming from the Helsinki University of Technology and the Aalto University School of Science, which I don't know. Um, for example, Herki Oya is one of them. He created the famous Oya rule. And it's used like a heavy and style learning. Teuber Kohonen, who created um, a whole new research area, um, developing so-called self-organizing maps. And last but not least, I don't know, Apu Hyverinen, something like that, um, developed further the area of independent component analysis that we'll talk about a bit later on. Um, he created uh, new methods to do fast independent component analysis that is used in many applications you can buy today on the market. So the whole thing with intelligence is about generating knowledge. Most of you um, have already dealt with the basic problem we see on the left side. So how to collect and gather raw data, read out sensors, store them in a database, and then what to do with it. In most cases, it will not be too much help for a physician, for example, if you just display him a static table with all the data because he has to interpret on themselves or himself. So what would really be a benefit for the healthcare sector, and not only the healthcare sector, is if you do something with the data before you display it to the user. So you go to all through these pre-processing steps like denoising, feature extraction, um, maybe sort of dimension reduction, clustering, pattern recognition, and finally display it in a meaningful sense. 
What I'm going to talk about today are some of the methods that are available in this middle part. So something for denoising, dimension reduction, and later on for classification purposes that you could use. Visualization is a whole other topic. Usability, human computer interfaces, if also the department is only dealing with these topics, how to build beautiful, good, and usable um, uh, applications, web applications, and products. So that would be far too much for today. So first I'll start with denoising, dimension reduction, and just tell you short in a few words about two typical um, yeah, algorithms that are being used in this area. So, if you have typically not only one signal, but like you are recording an ECG or an EMG on a body, you typically have many sensor readings. And in some cases, it would be necessary for you to only filter out what is the dominant signal of all this. So, this is where the principal component analysis comes in. For the ones of you who want to Google um, things like that, PCA is also abbreviated. PCA can help you when you try to extract dominant signals from a whole set of signals or if you want to get rid of the noise that is typically also part of every multiple sensor readings that you can imagine. So what would an electrical engineer typically do when he discovers noise? Someone know? Filters. Filters. Yeah. Most of them frequency based filters. So for example, if you have a uh, typical 50 hertz sound from your uh, sockets that is being mixed in, in some of the signals, the electrical engineer and the computer scientists applies a frequency filter, high pass filter, does some Fourier analyse analysis and tries to get rid of some of these components. But in some cases it might be useful not to filter out the complete signal at a certain frequency. For example, if you um, like I know, drum and bass music, and you have lots of bass going on in the 50 hertz region, it would be a mess with the music if you filter out all the 50 hertz stuff. So then you would need some techniques that do not rely on filters on frequency. And this could also be done with the principal component analysis. It requires some mathematics in here. And it also can be used for separating sig signals. And that sense if you try only to hunt for the most dominant signal. So the whole area is known for a so-called cocktail party problem, or as you might have experienced it, the hostel problem. If you imagine just um, 10 people, 20 people being in a single room together and everyone's talking concurrently. It's really hard to filter out what a certain or specific, specific person says at the moment. And what your brain does, what all our brains do is independent component analysis. You try to focus on a certain person, you try to find out what is he or she saying and filter out all the rest of the noise that doesn't interest you at the moment. So <clears throat> there's a nice web application you could um, test in the evening or after the lecture um, from R2V where, where this is demonstrated. You have the ability to um, activate some sound sources. The sound sources are randomly mixed together and it's simulated that you record these sources with a set of microphones. So when you listen to the sound of each of the microphones alone, you will have you will hear a completely mix of all these source signals. And the idea behind independent component analysis is that you try to filter out all the individual sources that have been mixed together. This might sound might sound easy. But um, as you might see, or as you will see, it is not here. So this is the recording of some sensors or some signals that have to mix together. Even if you look on the right side, you see it in a finer temporal resolution, but still, um, I guess now you would be able to figure out which signals would be the source signals of these. So then you can try to do something like independent component analysis. Um, independent component analysis relies on the fact that normally sources are statistically independent from each other. This is where one of the math things comes in. The essence of the central limit theorem states that if you mix some independent signals together, the result will be more, will be more Gaussian-like than each of the individual signals. 
Yes. Uh, yeah, the example you just have with the set of the microphones. Yeah. All the microphones are listening from one specific source. No. Okay. Just imagine a setup, I don't know, 60, 70 microphones in this room, yeah. somewhere randomly located, and you all start talking. So they're all recording all of the voices together. Okay. Yeah. So this is really a complete mix up of all the voices in one room and not um, focused on the single person. Yeah, I thought they were indeed they have to catch all the, the noise reports, but I thought they try to filter out all of them just one specific source. But that's no, this filtering is being done only afterwards. So you have at this point here really uh, the complete mixture of all the sources that can be equally loud. Um, they just should be statistically independent. This is the basic principle of the, of the RCA. We can use the mathematics in the background to try to separate the signals. So we try to set up some sort of a demixing matrix um, which results in separated signals again and we measure how Gaussian-like are these separated signals. The problem is that this cannot be calculated directly. So there is no algorithm that tells you in a, in a complete, complete fashion, okay, these values are the correct values. There are only approximations for this problem available. So a step-by-step -step recursive or iterative procedure which can optimize this demixing matrix by estimating um, the Gaussianity or non-Gaussianity of the resulting signals. But you don't have to calculate it by hand. There is, like I said before, uh, from Apu Hügerinen, the fast ICA package available in the net that you could use if you have this sort of problem and try to filter the signals you're interested in. So for example, these are the original signals from the slide you've seen just before, that one. If you mix these signals together, this complete mixture will come out. And on the right side you can see the result of the independent component analysis. So I've just clipped away some of the other signals, but it just shows you that it can basically find most of the signals. They are not 100% perfect. Like I said before, it's an approximation. But the ICA package is very useful for separating signals that are statistically independent. One of the applications that comes in useful in health segment is, for example, if you're trying to do an um, electrocardiogram for pregnant women. So if you're interested in the ECG of the unborn baby and the mother herself, you can, you can measure it. Here are four of the, I think, um, well, eight sensors, and the signals that with the eight sensors are being recorded. And you really have no chance by just looking at it what should be the mother's heartbeat and what is the heartbeat of the unborn baby. On the right side you see the same result from it from the ICA. Where you can see on the on the top left, on the topmost two rows, the dominant signal of the mother's heartbeat, but in the third row you can see the heartbeat of the unborn baby. So this is one application where ICA comes in handy. Okay. So so much for the first part, PCA, ICA, if you're recording signals, if you have problems with noise in it, if you have a mixture of signals and you want to decorrelate them. Now I want to tell you something about a few methods that you can use to generate rules, to bring more intelligence to your system. So, um, the first thing is, sometimes we like to have these rules automatically being generated. So instead of working out by hand, which parameters I have to um, bind together with AND and, and OR segments, um, we like to have an automatic rule generation. So one example I found on the internet is an expert system called Gas Oil by British Petrol. It's to control the separation of gas and oil. And the final system consists of about 2,500 uh, 2, rules. The British Petrol tried to estimate before they um, developed the system how much, how much time would it take for uh, their experts to figure out these rules. And they came to the conclusion it would cost about 10 person years in time. Then they hired a few computer scientist guys and they had set up the project in about 100 days. And it turned out that the final result even was better than the original experts and the system saves British Petrol million dollars a year. So, how did they do it? Um, I'd like to begin with an example. 
one of the everyday examples that some of you might also um, be have a problem is if, <coughs> should I go to the cinema tonight or not? So a typical process you go through when you have to decide something might be question yourself how attractive is the film? What did the critics say about it? And also a factor might be, am I going alone to the cinema um, or am I going in a group of five, four or more people? And then you might also play a role, for example, what category is the film on? So if I go five friends of mine to the cinema, I might not be interested in love movies or dramas, but action, science fiction or comedy movies would be appropriate. So you can draw a decision tree, like it is called, for every process, for every decision process you have to do. In the leaves of this tree, you can see the decisions themselves, and um, in between you have the attributes that are being questioned. So when you have your decision tree done and developed, it's easy for you to create rules out of it. So if you try to derive rules from it, you just go from the roots of the tree to every branch and you create your, for example, if statement. So if attractivity is medium and group size greater than two and category is in a set of action, science fiction, or comedy, then yes. And so you create in this example one, two, three, four, five, six, seven rules and you have your own small decision support system for your decision whether you go to the cinema or not. So creating this tree is a lot more difficult. Um, the goal you want to achieve is to have a compact tree, so it's like a very small tree, that gives you correct decisions for most of the examples, or for most of the decisions you might be interested in. But there is a simple heuristic method you could use. Just select the most important unused attribute first. So don't select any attributes but select the most important one first. But the question is, what is importance in that sense? Importance, or the most important attribute, is the one that makes the best differentiation for all the examples you have. So if you find one attribute, and you can um, state or make a clear question, and all of the examples that say yes are on one side of the tree, and all examples that say no are on the other side of the tree, you have found your best attribute. One of that might be something like the body temperature in our niches. The patient comes to a physician and the physician measures the body temperature and, <coughs> and he, um, he realizes body temperature is above 37 degrees Celsius or something, then the clear decision, the patient is ill. If he's not ill, he might be looking for different parameters that could help him in his decision. So this is the importance. But the problem is, the importance cannot be calculated beforehand. The importance of attributes changes during the decision process. So basically, um, a recursive algorithm is being set up where you, for each recursion step, you try to find what is the most important attribute and take this one to make the first decisions. The general importance formalism can also be stated mathematically in that sense that you look for the information content or so-called entropy of a certain attribute. So what does it contribute to the decision? That's the basic question for um, each single attribute. Luckily, there are also several algorithms already available. So ID3, uh, or especially C4.5, to name you one of the most commonly used algorithms for creating decision trees at the moment. And you also find lots of software, um, we have reference at the end of the slides, so where you can take a look um, to integrate it into your software system, for example, to automatically generate rules for you. Decision trees are really very handy. So um, they are not only attractive to look at if you try to create rules, but you can also use them to interpret a certain problem you're having to decide. For example, important attributes will most probably come up to the top of this decision tree. And less important attributes you will find more in the area of the leaves. And you also if you use the right software, you can automatically let be create, uh, code created for you. So you can create C++ or Java code right from the um, software that has calculated the decision tree for you. Now, I would like to move over to a different research area. So one of the big role models for many computer scientists and neuroscientists the thing we all are carrying inside of our heads, 
about the brain. Um, there are some typical numbers. So each of our brains are approximately the same from size, from the number of neurons you have in your brain, about 100 million, uh, sorry, 100 billion neurons, of course. So each time you're um, trying to party at the hostel, some 10,000 of these neurons will die. But hey, what does it matter if you have 100 billions of them? Each of these neurons is connected to 5 to 10,000 other neurons. And this is what gives you the complexity of the brain and why it's not really easy to find out how is the brain working. How do animals or humans process the data we are um, seeing, hearing, tasting, feeling the whole day, and how emotions or anything else might be created? But there are some methods to try to find out how does the brain work. And I would only like to talk to you about some very basic or simple models. So if you take a look at the neurons, um, they all look quite similar. So you don't have only one neuron type in your brain, you have several hundreds of neuron types in your brain, but the basic, the basics for all those are quite the same. So if you look at them as a typical computational unit, you can see on the left side the thing called the dendritic tree, this is, so say, the input section of the neuron. You have the soma, this is where the calculations are going on, and where all the incoming signals are simply being added up and the axon hillock where the outgoing signal is being created. And this outgoing signal is transmitted by the axons to, again, five to 10,000 other neurons. And this is the first step where <coughs> mathematicians came in and said, we try to build a model of this. A very simple model, and very old model, is this one. But it's, um, it shows quite good what it's all about. <coughs> so basically, for every neuron you try to um, have in your artificial neural network, you model it as some variable, let's call it x, uh, where the input signal is being coded. You also have the connection between neurons, simply modeled by a weight, like it's called all the time, and the soma, simply modeled as all the summation of all the weighted input that comes to a certain neuron. Generation of the output of the neuron is mostly done, or most commonly done, by using a simple non-linear function, it's also called an activation function, a squashing function. And this output gives inputs to the neurons on the next layer or on to the neighborhood. These individual neurons are then connected. There are also again several numerous ways how these networks can be built. Um, the most easy one, and the one that can be used for all the rather static data I called or I mentioned at the beginning, is the so-called feed-forward neural network. So you have one part of the network that is used as the input, you feed input in it, like maybe this could be your two ears, where you sense um, acoustic signals, then it is pre-processed from one layer to the other, and finally generates an output, like I heard the word, uh, word yes, or I heard the word no, or something like that. Um, the mathematics behind this is quite simple, and also learning in the mathematical sense um, is quite an easy task compared to the other side, when you say you have no restriction how all these neurons are connected. So you also could have connections um, backwards to a previous layer, or connections to the to neurons on the same layer or something. In that sense, the learning process become really difficult and hard to do. You will only need these type of neurons in most cases where you um, deal with time varying data, where you need some sort of memory um, so that the neural network can look back what I have seen some seconds, some minutes before. So first we'll, I will only deal with these types of networks here, the so-called feed forward networks. Learning, also in the sense of artificial neural networks, is similar like the process you all know from the beginning, from the kindergarten, from the day you were born um, up to now, to your exams that you would have at the end of the semester. You hear some examples, you're being told how it should look like, what you should know, what you should do. Um, and you get examples from your trainers, from your lecturers. At the end, you will be tested. You will, in most cases, 
exam, <coughs> some new question with a new example that you have not seen so far. And uh, you will be tested how good you can work out these questions. Are your answers right? Are your answers wrong? And finally, you're judged based upon your answers if you have learned enough or you haven't learned anything. Or you just make use of enough. So typically, the data you have in your lectures or also the data you um, collect through some sensors split up for the learning process into training data, the data you will train your network with, and the test or validation data with which you will evaluate the network later on. These are the basic principles of learning. <coughs> the learning itself is mostly done by error correction. So similar methods like in living, um, living beings, you have something like desired output. What should the network do? What should be the response of a network? And you have the actual output of the network itself. And a simple error function could, for example, be just to sum up all the differences. So if you have n examples that you present the system, you see how many of these examples did the system get right, how many of them did get wrong. And the lower the error is, the better the system is already. And learning itself is then performed by simply adjusting the weights of the network. So not the connections themselves, not the activation function is being tuned, but in most circumstances when you're dealing with networks, you um, alter the weights of the network, connection between the neurons. And when you alter the network connections, you will probably get a different answer than before. The error gets lower, the network is better. The error gets higher, done some, something wrong with the learning rules, how to adjust these weights. <coughs> so, basically, learning can also be seen as an optimization problem. <coughs> it's the same here as you have it, uh, for example, in some economic surroundings where you have a cost function. You have some attributes that contribute to an overall cost of a process, and you try to uh, tune the parameters that are free to tune, and you see how can you lower the cost. Learning here is the same. You try to alter the weights of the network and see if the overall error function is getting smaller or not. So, in a mathematical sense, um, you're, you can do, if you have an error function that is differentiable, continues a differentiable, you can do something like a gradient descent. You don't have to know exactly what it is, but just simply imagine you have um, a function and you're calculating the derivative of the function, so you know in which direction is it going down, in which direction is it going up. And this derivative helps you find a better weight or better weights for a network. So when you plot a very simple error function in three-dimensional space, for example, if you're on the left side, you see a small valley in here. So if you have a certain set for your weights, for example, you start in this part here and you calculate the derivative, it will showing a vector that is showing towards the descent. And the basic idea behind all these so-called gradient descent methods, you will find gradient descent methods not only here in, in artificial neural networks, but um, in very different um, research areas too. The basic idea is just calculate this gradient and take a little step in the direction where the error gets less. for changing weights is simply the gradient itself multiplied by some constant in these surroundings called the learning rate. So that you don't make huge steps. So with huge steps you might actually miss the valley and step over it, but just make some small steps towards a possibly optimal solution. But the problem with all these non-linear error functions, and most of the error functions you will um, approach in neural networks or also in economics is that you don't have only one minima. So typical nonlinear functions have many minima that can be anywhere in your parameter subspace. So the problem with learning with gradient descent is basically that how good your solution end will be depends on where you start. So to take this simple example of an error function, you can well see that if you only can, can go in one direction downwards, um, it depends where you start, whether you can reach the real global minimum or just get trapped in one of the local minimums. So 
typically, if you try to find an optimal solution for a non-linear problem, you not only start once with the training, but you start 10, 100, 1,000 times. Every time you choose random different start points, so a random initialization of your parameters, and then do a gradient descent, and at the end compare what it was your best solution, what was the best trained network that you found, and you take this one as your production system, for example. Just to give you a basic idea about learning with nonlinear error functions. A different possibility possibility would be to avoid nonlinear um, segmentation of your data. So also um, quite some mathematically intense, but just to give an idea, um, in the 60s, ah, okay, 1965, a guy called Carroll came up with a theorem on the separability of patterns. He just stated that if you have a really hard problem to solve in a low dimensional space, for example, if you have three parameters you measure, and um, you realize that it's not, if you're not able to separate them with a linear function, it might be easier if you um, develop a nonlinear function, transform it to a very high dimensional space. So the probability that, that you can find a linear separation in this high dimensional space is much higher. So a different approach is that has been used in so-called radial basis function networks and also in support vector machines. Just use all your low dimensional data, project it non linear to a high dimensional space, and try to find a linear separation plane in this high dimensional space. Because then you don't have the problem of dealing with non linear error functions or things like that. <coughs> um, just to give you a short example, what are such projections to high dimensional space? Some of you might um, know some sorts of function if you try to transform a uh, data structure that has a dimension of M0 like it's stated here above and you try to transform it to a M1 dimensional space you just have to take M1 different nonlinear functions that all can take an M0 dimensional vector input argument and voila you have your data projected to a one M1 dimensional space so it is not really um, difficult to be done but it's quite hard to understand in the first place because never, when you've never dealt with high dimensional data But to give you an example, um, as computer scientists, most of you know the XOR function. So we have two variables, A and B, or like I call it here, X and Y. So X, X or Y is well defined. So if one of these two is one, the output is one. And if both of them or none of them is one, the output is zero. You can see a plot of the error function, uh, of the XOR function right up here. So the circles denote two possibilities where only one of the arguments is one and the others are two, uh, zero. So you can now try as hard as you would like to find uh, a simple straight line to separate circles from the squares. You will not be able to find a straight line to separate them. Will you? No, you can prove it mathematically that it is not possible to find a straight line that separates this data perfectly. But just for, as an example for the um, transformation to high dimensional space, just take this function as an example. We have a nonlinear component in here, and for all our possible inputs, variables x and y, we now get three dimensional coordinates instead of the two dimensions we had before. So these data points are being projected from the two to a three dimensional space, and now we can see that we can find a plane, a simple plane that we can. Um, construct so that it's in between the circles and the squares, and we can separate these data points in a linear manner. Just give you some basic ideas about um, that Kava's idea might actually work. Yeah. This is also the thing that has been done with all many medical applications. We have a quite high dimensional data that is definitely not linear separable. You transform it to an even higher dimensional space and try to find linear planes that can perfectly separate the data points belonging to different classes from each other. And we then have some networks that um, try to use these methods, like one of them just mentioned, the name Radial Basis Function Network is one of the first 
that casts the low dimensional data to a high dimensional space and then tries to find a simple linear plane to separate it. Um, much more advanced and currently some state of the art if you really want to do pattern classification, classify, for example, patients that are ill from those that are not ill, the so called support vector machines. Also, there are many software libraries available you could use, so you don't have to program anything yourself. Support vector machines <coughs> um, also um, incorporate this casting of data to a high dimensional space and use some other features too. Support vector machines have um, a very specific property. They're not trying to find simply any of those possible hyperplanes that can separate data, but try to find the so-called best or optimal hyperplane. So best hyperplane, um, I have an example here. Just forget about all these origins and vector stuff. Just concentrate on these data points here. So just for example, we have data from two different classes, one with filled circles and just the circles alone. So we could separate this data with an infinite number of lines. Some of the lines I've drawn in here. So all the red lines and also the blue line separate perfectly the one data, the one class from the other. But the blue line is special. This is the, the, the property of the support vector machine. It does not try to find one of the red lines, for example, like a normal neural network or RBF network would do, but it tries to find the best hyperplane in terms of the one that has the biggest margin around it. So the one where you have the margin to any of these um, examples that you have in the training set, where the margin is really the, the largest. So this maximization of the margin around the separating hyperplane gives a very high robustness against noise in your data. So if you're measuring data and you know you have noise in it, it would be good if you have a separating hyperplane that really has some um, space or some, um, yeah, some possibility for noise to interact without um, getting to a false result. So support vector machines currently recently really if you're trying to have find a classification um, for a lot of data that might be noisy, is one of the state of the art methods that you could use. Finding the optimal hyperplane is not that easy. There exists a deterministic solution if you have really, if you know your data is linear separable, it becomes a bit more complicated if you know your data is still not linear separable. So you might add features like we heard before, casting dimension, um, casting your data to a high dimensional space and then try to find a linear separable hyperplane, for example, then it might work. But uh, anyway, even if you don't find a linear separable hyperplane, you can use support vector machines because they have some methods how to deal with examples that are still on the wrong side. It's just for the idea. So, what time is it now? Okay, this will work out fine. Um, just to remember, when, we started, when I started the talk, I told you something about time varying signals, ECG, EMG, um, data you get from accelerometers, like when you're wearing one of these watches that have the accelerometers built in, um, then it becomes a bit more difficult if you try to classify, for example, movements with your accelerometer. You have to use methods that use some sort of memory, at least if you, um, you're using neural networks. So it's not really possible to use simple feed-forward networks with all those handy gray and descent and direct calculation of optimal results when you're having data that's varying in its length. So we have to use current networks and that are really hard to train. There exist some solutions that already go back to the 1970s, 80s I think, but um, yeah, they're not giving really good results. Some better methods came up in about 2001-2002 when two research groups developed concurrently but with quite different methods behind it um, the so-called reservoir computing. Reservoir computing is this term that sums up these two technologies. One, the so-called liquid state machine, as it was called in the beginning, 
the other so-called ecostate networks, one from Graz, where I work, and the other from the Fraunhofer Institute by Herbert Jäger in Germany. So they share the basic same idea. The main difference is in the type of neurons they're using. Just explanation, the ecostate networks uses these types of neurons I've talked before. So a simple mathematical model simplifying input weights and outputs. And the liquid state machine tries to use real biological realistical models of neurons with spikes being generated and not averages of spikes and things like that. But we won't go into much detail um, just to give you the idea what is new in dealing with recurrent or learning in recurrent neural networks with these reservoir computing approaches. Both share the idea of having a pool of recurrent neurons that is being randomly generated. Like you see on the right side, a so-called neural microcolumn, where you just have a bunch of randomly generated neurons that are randomly connected with each other, and also the weights are being set randomly. You're also not interested in trying to find optimal weights within this pool of neurons. You're just feeding the pool of neurons with some inputs. So you're connecting one of your sensors, for example, or so several sensors to some of the neurons. You perturbate the pool, the pool so you, um, you're bringing it out of its steady state that it would, it would possibly have or probably have without any input. And then you're just watching this pool. What does it do? How does it react to the, to the input? And as you could, can see if you look at simulations, is that it's very differently reacting depending on the input you feed into it. So calculation with memory in these sorts of reservoir computing approaches is basically done with readout neurons, <coughs> so just simple linear neurons that you connect to some of the or all of the neurons from this pool and try to read out the state try to get a feeling for the behavior of this pool and just from the state of the pool try to make some classifications or things like that. So only the weights of these readout neurons are subject to training or the other weights are simply randomly generated. There was actually a very nice presentation a few years ago by some students on the conference where they tried to um, yeah, physically build this idea. So they took I don't know how good it can be seen on projection. They just took an aquarium, a glass aquarium, filled it with water, put it on top of an overhead projector, and mounted a camera on top of this overhead projector to watch the pool, how it reacts. And then they placed on each side of, the, of this aquarium Lego bricks that are controlled by a simple motor. And these Lego bricks can be dipped into the water, so perturbated. And then they connected a microphone, simplified a microphone to these motors instead of a loudspeaker membrane, and um, did speech recognition with this aquarium and this bucket of water. It was quite impressive because it worked. So no desktops, no high-speed computing interfaces, just a bucket of water, and you can do speech recognition. So when you Take the pictures from the camera above, you see the equilibrium state where the water isn't doing anything. And if you um, activate one or more of these actuators, you will see that, of course, like you know, it's when you drop a stone in the pond, waves will be generated. And the principle behind this pool of water or this pool of neurons is simply that all the neurons are interacting. So, also in this case, the water is a high speed computer. It solves differential equations in millions in parallel in this every second of its existence. So the pattern that evolves on the surface of this water is different whether you have the sound of one or zero, for example, I can it here. And the speech recognition is simply, simply looking at the surface of the water and see how different these waves are interacting with each other. This should give you just a basic idea of how this reservoir computing approach is working. It's working really good for all classification stuff you do with time varying data. So whenever you, for example, have to control a robot, where a robot should learn how to be steered in a, in a labyrinth, for example, you could um, use this, for example, infrared sensors on the input and let the motors be controlled by the outputs of these readout neurons. And you can learn this 
through micro column to steer this for example. Yes? Uh, this is Jan. Um, <coughs> Different approach that I'd just like to mention at the end, that some of you might already know, are the so-called hidden markets models. I won't go into details here, I'm just mentioning because they are a computational or computer science state of the art for recognition of time running data also. So these are being widely used for speech recognition, um, crypt analysis, machine translation, and also what might be useful for some groups, gesture recognition. So with hidden markets models, you have the opportunity. You also find uh, final developed projects on the web that use, for example, the remote controllers for, to recognize whether the user does some circling um, um, movement or he's drawing a square in the air or whatever it does. So with hidden markets models, for example, you could build an application that tries to monitor the movement of patients and watch if they're doing the right physiotherapy, for example. Yeah. So, in market models are basically just um, a statistical model where you differentiate between the actual process that is going on, but you cannot observe it directly. So this, this is why it's called the hidden market model. And you have some observations you can make. So in this example, Weather could be sunny, rainy, or cloudy. But imagine you cannot take a look outside of the window to see whether it's really sunny, rainy, or cloudy. You just have a um, measurement device that measures the humidity. And you can only make the observation today the air is more dry, dryish, damp, or really soggy. And you watch the development of the humidity for a few days. And then you have to make a guess, how was the weather during the last few days? And you have to come up with a correct answer. Well, on the first day it was sunny, then it was rainy, then it was again sunny, and on the fourth day it was cloudy. But, as you might imagine, also on sunny days, the humidity could be dry, with a very high probability. It could also be soggy, if it had rained the day before, for example. So it's not an easy task to come up with the correct solution for what has really been going on if you just have an observation of some of the attributes that you might measure. And this is the idea behind, yeah, for example, um, the recognition of movements when you have accelerometers. You can measure um, some directions in x, y, z directions. You can measure, measure your role and things like that. But you have no idea what the users really do. Is he really trying at least to make a straight line in the air and then a sharp 90 turn degree or is it somehow doing it in the right manner or right fashion? There are some observations about sensor readings <coughs> and you're training hidden market models to find the best estimate. What is the movement with the highest probability that has caused these measurements you've observed? And this is the idea behind the market models. Again, you will find lots of software that you can use to train models. So if you have an accelerometer in your project and you would like to um, measure whether a patient is falling, for example, and not only with a threshold, but to find out in which way he, she was falling, you could try to use hypnotic models to detect the real motion of the patient, for example. So with that, with that I will like to come nearly to an end. At the end of the presentation, I've collected some books, some references for you, for those of you who might be interested in reading more details, um, getting to know all the mathematical stuff behind it. Um, there are some really good books about neural networks that can be used in lectures as well, like Haken, Whitman Frank for data mining, Mitchell's book about machine learning, and so on and so on. Also, software packages. Um, Matlab, most of you might know, has some very good toolboxes for um, similar validating of decomposition. You find toolboxes for the independent component analysis that fits well into MATLAB, also neural network toolboxes and so on. Um, what I really would like to show is Weka. Weka is an open source project that's been developed at the University of New Zealand. And with, open, with Weka, you have a tool that you can use to visualize the data, to manipulate the data, and 
um, especially you have lots and all of these methods I talked about and lots more um, already implemented. And you can also use the libraries that come with Weka to compile it with your project and use it directly in your project. So basically you, when you use Weka you don't have to do much programming, just interfacing and using all the, the, the algorithms that are available here. Mm. Um, just to give you a hint, to the, the last side of this generation knowledge projects, some good books I read about usability, usability testing by Stephen Krug, Don't Make Me Think, the title already says it, um, the user should not be forced to think where should I click, what should I do, and this book gives some really good hints and also web usability and rocket surgery made easy, how you really can design good applications that have a good user interface. Yeah, also two simulators that could be used for reservoir computing approaches you can find here. With that, I'd like to come to the end of my talk and hope your brain doesn't hurt and thank you all for your attention.